Hey, this is Jeff Gannon, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast. This is the podcast where Andrew and I talk general investing concepts. To learn about specific stocks I like, go to focuscompoundinggazette.com. That's focuscompoundinggazette.com, and enter your email. Once you enter your email, you'll start getting one free 2,000-word stock write-up a week. Andrew and I also manage accounts for clients. To learn more about our managed accounts, email Andrew at info at focuscompounding.com or text or call Andrew at 469-207-5844. And now here's Andrew with your regularly scheduled podcast. All right. We are back. Mm-hmm. We're wearing the same clothing for three podcasts in a row. Yeah. That's right. We don't we don't go home and change everyone. The weather's the same. Huh? The weather is the same. The weather is the same. We still got the special effects going on. Still in the middle of a tornado. Still wearing mm-hmm. our same clothes. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in. Obviously, we record a bunch when we do meet up. I um, hope everyone is having a great day. Before we jump into it, this is going to be a podcast focused on management. Okay. And I know for a fact, I don't think we've ever dedicated a podcast just to yeah. management. Yeah. So um, thank you so much. And we're going to get into that. But before that... Of course, we got a plug. Go to focuscompoundinggazette.com yeah. mm-hmm. and be sure to sign up for Jeff's weekly email that gets sent out. Um, how, have, have people been going there and signing up? Yes. Good. And you have something there each week, too. I that, do. So if you want to know what's on my mind, <laughs> yep. which yep. you probably a don't. column at the end. I do have a column mm-hmm. at the end. And I will write about whatever comes in this guy's mind. Sometimes yeah. it'll be about maybe a book or investing or I don't even know. Yeah, so. you can see a list of overlooked stocks and you get a 2,000-word uh, stock write up every week. Yeah, so be sure to sign up for that. And if you're listening on the podcast side and you want to help us out, please um, give us a rating and review. That mm-hmm. uh, helps spread the word as all of our um, most active listeners know because I say it pretty much every podcast. Every podcast, yeah. All righty, so let's jump into it. So management. Yes. We're going to talk about management, um, and I'm just going to throw out some questions that I have, okay. and then we'll just kind of see where it goes. And the first question, and I think this is probably the most basic one, or maybe the uh-huh. most obvious one to ask, is what are the first things you look for in a management team? Uh, that they've been there a while, that they have a history of past behavior that I can uh, judge that they're like how their words and their actions line up or not, Yeah, and um, their capital allocation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you judge that? I mean, is it like reading the transcripts? So, listening to the past earnings yeah, calls, so seeing what they, they promised, or not what they promised, but what they said, and how they, yeah. how they, you know, performed. Yeah, it's easiest if they've been there a really long time. Uh huh. So, if they haven't been there a really long time, that's a problem. Uh, I don't know how to judge management that's been there a year or something and hasn't been uh, with the company long term. So, how long have they been with the company? If they've been in a different position in the company, are they related to family members or things that might have control? things like that, uh, then you have a better idea that the past behavior of the company is going to continue under this management. Um, so, and, and then um, in terms of cap allocation stuff, yeah, you look at past behavior mostly, sometimes what they say. Um, although you, you always want to line up what they're saying with um, what that behavior is. So if you can find cases where they bought back stock or something, try to see what they were saying back then Yeah. Uh, and what they're saying now. And there's plenty of management things where they might be saying things that uh, – you know, would be good signs, but I've never seen them actually carry out those things. You know, it just doesn't seem likely. So, mm-hmm. And then when it comes to, I guess, like their compensation, how do you typically think about that? Yeah, so for um, stocks that are uh, registered with the SEC, they will include the compensation stuff in a proxy statement each year. And you can see on what basis they're um, compensated. Yeah. And so... You know, like we own NACO, and NACO's uh, compensation for top executives is generally tied to, like, um, mostly basic things that you'd expect every company to tie it to. The two things that jumped out at me were they're also compensated on the return on tangible capital employed at um, their one consolidated mine, which probably is a low return on tangible capital employed. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked that because that's a concern is that they might put too much money into it and stuff like that. So there is some compensation, not a large amount, but some tied directly to their mind that way. And then some of their compensation is tied to uh, what's probably a um, like uh, business development, like getting new minds or something, because it's not uh, some there's some items that are not disclosed mm-hmm. exactly what they are. Just, Have you ever seen uh, management's compensation tied to market cap? Or like growth of market cap or the share price? I'm aware of one company where that's the case. <laughs> what company? A Tesla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, We've was, talked about that before. Yeah, I, it was I, Elon, right? Yeah, Yeah, I said that that, I think I've said that that makes sense. For? For Tesla. For Tesla, why yeah, is that? Yeah, they have to tap public markets to have financing. That's what I said about Tesla from the beginning when everyone's asked about it. Yeah. You know, uh, does it help to have a CEO behave that way and stuff? 
it helps if you need to be in the public eye all the time. That company can't be financed unless it's that way all the time. I mean, WeWork is a similar situation. I mean, not that they have a similar CEO and everything, but they have to find ways to get people to write magazine articles about them and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. It gives them exposure. Yeah. What are, do you have any advice for spotting a crooked management team? Yes. So I wrote a post once about it and I compared it literally as like a checklist as um, behavior that would be similar to a psychopath. And that's true. So in general, um, uh, the issues with management uh, with any of these things are so um, long term type. So behavior that is, makes sense from like a long term perspective. Um, the behavior that is like treating shareholders and stuff as if it's going to be an ongoing relationship. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, Warren and Charlie will say, uh, honesty is the best policy. Yeah. And they'll say, we didn't say that honesty is, you know, morally superior or something. We meant it actually makes you more money over time. And that's true if, in terms of your long term reputation, it is better to be completely honest with people. Like, for instance, with Warren or something, it's better to say, I don't, um, participate in auctions or something and then never participate in an auction. Uh, say this is my final bid and then never make another bid. Yeah. Uh, it helps in negotiations and things long term doing that. But it hurts in individual cases. So he would be better off uh, cheating on that policy in individual situations. Yeah. But then long term, your reputation is harmed by that. Sure. So what we're looking at is are there situations of like, um, uh, are there things that management wouldn't do in some cases? It's always a question I have if I talk to management or talk to people about management is what do you get the impression they wouldn't do even if they thought it would you know, make sense, make more money or something. And um, th- those kinds of questions are best that way. So I, I think there's a short-term orientation to it. There's an opportunistic uh, approach that they, yeah, that's one way to spot crooked management. Um, there are things just like verbally um, that are pretty easy to spot. Um, in general, uh, a lot of things where they're telling you something that would make sense from the perspective of that you would want to hear it, sure. but don't make a lot of sense from the perspective that they're saying it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always good to flip that around. When any time anyone's talking to you, um, it's good to not think of your own interests and try to think of it from the perspective of why they're saying this and stuff. What most people's mistake is, is um, they come into, whether they're hearing management talk or any sort of thing like that, and they're thinking, what do they want out of it? But that makes it easy to con you if you would come into some situation thinking about your own interests, then it's very easy to be conned. Mm-hmm. But if you come into it thinking about what are the interests of the other people here, then it's very hard to be conned. Sure. You almost really have to uh, allow yourself to, to fall for those sorts of things by thinking so much about what you want out of it. So if you want a stock that does whatever these sorts of things are. So, you know, like for instance, management will sometimes pick up on the sorts of things that value investors like to hear. And they'll, use those terms and put them back to value investors. Yeah, sure. I mean, value investors may fall for those sorts of things, but it's clear that they're using it without much understanding. Yeah, even I've like, read transcripts or, or listened to calls before. I'm like, wow, he's definitely like kind of playing the game a little bit. Right. Trying to appeal to. Yeah. yeah. But they've had meetings and things with people yeah. who keep saying these things to them. So they think, Oh, how do I please them? I I know how to do that. I'm going to use the, yeah. the, the kind of words that they bit. use and stuff that you play to, um, play to them that way, that, that group. Um, so yeah, you pander to them that way and stuff. And so any signs of those sorts of things, um, have you ever analyzed a company didn't invest because you felt like it was a bit sketchy mm -hmm. and then the company ended up becoming like a fraud of some sort? Yes. Okay. You don't need to say (laughs) the company, but what was it that sketched you out or made you steer clear of it? Uh, it's happened many, many times with Chinese companies. Mm-hmm. Chinese reverse. So do you just do you just automatically re- kind of write them off in your head because reverse well, Chinese reverse yeah, mergers? I mean, chi- Chinese all, reverse merger, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Chinese reverse yeah. merger, yes. Just write it off. Uh-huh. Uh, Chinese company, they're legitimate companies in China, and and but but a company that is listing in the U.S. Why is it doing that? You know that whole thing. Any company that's listing in another country that's not their home country that's telling a certain story and stuff to foreigners and st- that's all. I would be very cautious about that anyway. Mm-hmm. And that could be true in, in any – I mean, there's some legitimate cases with it where they want to avoid a stigma or something. I know of some, like, Greek companies that listed in the U.K. or something. They were just trying to avoid the fact that no one was investing in them uh, from outside the country because they were in Greece. But I also know of others in which they were frauds. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say, uh, yes, I have 
there have been several uh, cases where that's happened, and not just Chinese companies. Yeah, uh-huh. the best example is um, Valiant. Really? Yeah. So you did a deep dive on Valiant? No, I did not do a deep dive on Valiant. Why did you steer clear of Valiant originally when you looked at it? It didn't look good. Because of the price increases or what? No, not because of the price. But increases. that just what management was saying. Really? Yeah. Was this before the the huge fall? Yeah, when Valiant Acton had went in the and doubled pattern. Down on it. Valiant had the pattern, and we talked about another stock that I don't know if we want to say the name of the stock and stuff, but it was in our Breeze Eastern one. It had a pattern that, regardless of whether the management was corrupt or something like that, is not a pattern you want to see. It's like a, a chain letter type pattern mm-hmm. in that it has to keep doing bigger and bigger yeah. deals. Yeah. Uh, the economics of the deals are probably getting worse and worse, but it has on to keep telling uh, investors that they're not doing worse and then trying to do bigger and bigger deals, which are more and more difficult uh, acquisitions that way. That can be tough. Um, it just has a, it, it was very similar to what you saw. I mean, I read about, I wasn't alive then in like the sixties and stuff with the conglomerate era. Um, and very similar to those and how they all worked out. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of them were legitimate companies that eventually were broken up and stuff, and that's the case with Valiant. It owned a bunch of legitimate uh, businesses and stuff, but what they were doing and what they were selling to investors was the the problem, not like the actual things they owned. That happens sometimes where you see something um, that... Uh, the it's it's not like a the product or anything doesn't have anything fraudulent with it. The business might be fine, but some stuff that management is doing is is a problem. I mean, mostly it's when they're selling something to investors that doesn't make sense to me. And the case that Valiant was putting forward didn't seem sustainable to me. Mm-hmm. But that's true for you, made it, you. You thought that they were on like that roller coaster, right? And eventually the the song was going to stop, or what? Yes, that's true. So what about Trans Time then? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, those things can. St- you can stop those things, and Valiant could have stopped at some point uh-huh. uh, if they gotten someone else in there and decided to not present themselves a certain way to sh- to shareholders. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, but it's tempting to continue to do that. I, you know, in bull markets and things, it also it can be, um, you know, easier to do that, and that's potentially more of a problem. But you know that that happens with a lot of things it's it's something there's i can think of lots and lots of cases of things where i saw something and said well that can't keep going on Mm -hmm. um but that doesn't mean it's a fraud or something you know yeah it's just easier to probably steer clear of that stuff anyways right yeah but also just if you just read if you go back and read the filings and things the presentations that they were doing they had presentations that didn't make any sense i couldn't figure out what they were saying um, which doesn't mean it's a fraud, but I mean, I mentioned something about GE a while back. I was reading stuff about GE, and I read all their 10K and stuff, and I still couldn't figure out um, what they were trying to tell me about how they treated certain um, uh, long-term contracts mm-hmm. having to do with uh, things like jet engines. Jet engines is an example of it. Um, and uh, that bothered me about it. Mm. And that doesn't mean it's a fraud or anything, but I got the impression they didn't want people to understand the accounting. Yeah. Well, Buffett said that, right? Yeah. If, if you, for example, for him, if he can't understand it, he it's probably because they don't want him to understand it. Yes. Why do you think Ackman got so, like, seduced by Valiant? I don't I know. I mean, because remember he came out and said it's the next person. Sequoia halfway. did. Yeah, too. Sequoia, too. Yeah. It's very attractive. If you think of it from your interest of what he wants to find there, yeah, then it makes perfect sense, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's you, exactly a value investors compound. I mean, we talk about compound compound our, machine, right? Our, yeah, it is called focus compounding. Yeah, yeah they they were selling compounding. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and they're not. I mean, they're not wrong. It could have been like the next Berkshire Hathaway if they had chosen to do that. Uh-huh. You didn't get the impression from reading about it and how they talked about things that it was, um, especially the presentation of certain things. So there were some things that were. Um, and there are other companies like this, but there are some things they would do presentations where they talk about like how the deals performed and stuff. I couldn't figure out what that meant. I think they were just telling us the deals are good. You know, yeah. it's 18 months later and the deals on track, it's good, you know? Um, but there was all this stuff that like that, that I couldn't figure out. And that's common with these, mm-hmm. uh, sorts of things. Um, which is not at Berkshire. Berkshire's the opposite. If you read the early letters and stuff, you see some very good compounding results while reading letters that tell you a bunch about how this didn't go well, that didn't go well, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. No, I mean, you don't want, in general, you don't want the um, uh, the CEO or whatever of the company that you're investing in to, to be making cases like as if they're a politician or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a reason politicians behave the way they do. It's they need to get enough people to believe in them, b- to yeah, believe in them, sure. to vote for them yeah. once every so often, uh, even if that has no reality to what they can do. And they're competing against other people who 
can make other promises and things. So you they're in a really bad situation. Uh, you can get into that situation as a CEO or something if you do certain things because you start to make certain promises and then you say I have to hit those certain numbers. Taking the GE example, uh, I my guess is that that accounting has stuff to do with them wanting to report certain earnings mm-hmm. figures. Sure. Because yeah. I don't see how that accounting that was there would translate into the a cash flow that's equivalent to the, the profit that they're talking about, basically. Yeah. What I care about is the free cash flow. Sure. What they probably thought investors cared about and what they did, I'm sure, at a big conglomerate like GE, uh, wasn't free cash flow, earnings. it was earnings. Yeah. And that would help in, you know, reporting those sorts mm-hmm. of things. But it, I found it very confusing. And, you know, there, there's some other cases where I've read things. Anytime that you can't, I guess, I, I don't want to say anytime you can't understand the accounting because a lot of times I get emails from people saying, I, one thing I don't like talking too much about management being, um, whether they're crooked or whatever, is because there seems to be too much of an impression of that among investors. They're sure. very concerned with like being taken in uh, and fooled by management and whatever. And the bigger risk is, look, overwhelmingly the big risks are the industry's too tough and stuff, and management does the best they can, but they're still going to fail. Yeah. Um, two is that uh, management is incompetent in some way or follows the wrong strategy or whatever. And, and then less likely is that, you know, management is less aligned with you and stuff, which is an issue, which is not really that management's crooked, but their interests in yours aren't exactly the same. Sure. We talked about a case before where I said that, you know, there was a gap in um, the market price of the stock was a lot lower than the um, net asset value. But if the uh, controlling shareholder, the, um, the controlling in terms of votes, bought back shares, he'd be lowering his own yeah. uh, mm-hmm. fees. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's big conflict of interest. It's a right big there. conflict sure. of interest that you yeah. have, and and that happens with management things. Management one huge conflict of interest that management always has compared to shareholders is that shareholders are usually short term oriented shareholders, and management cares much less about the um, the performance of the stock and much more about the survival of the company. Sure, much more, mm-hmm. and that not just that, and that's another thing you'll see at all levels of management. One thing that shareholders always always underestimate is that at all levels of management a company the biggest thing they want is not to fire anyone Mm -hmm. they and this is not i'm not talking about you know japan or something here i'm talking about the united states and which has this reputation for you know short-term capitalism that it has Mm -hmm. and everything uh if you really get to what people managers at all levels want to do they would be happy they they want the number of units of whatever they're doing to be a little bit higher this year than last year and stuff they don't want to fire anyone that they um have Mm -hmm. right that's their bi- that whatever they tell you the truth is that that's actually it yeah is that more than anything they always want to run the company in a way that they don't have to fire people why do you think that is <laughs> because human it's un- nature it's unpleasant to do that sure. i mean and especially for instance you don't think some people take um take uh like they think that's fun to fire do people? you ever watch entourage like Ari well, Gold? <laughs> no it might be it might be if you replaced uh, the manager. Sure. The yeah. prop. It's very easy for someone to come in and fire people that were hired by the previous manager. Yeah. It, it's very hard. That's always a problem that you have. Like in some cases, if something's gone wrong in a company for a while, it can be helpful just to switch the management, simply because they don't have any uh, legacy loyalty to not just the people involved, but the projects and all sorts of things that they've you know they've done there. They can do whatever they want at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, they can come in with a fresh view that way. But other people, you know, they can't really say, well, the strategy we've been following has been a dumb one. Um, some do. Yeah. I've, I've listened to CEOs and stuff where that was the case. They usually have, they're often founders. They're usually huge owners of the stock. You know, I I heard one that I won't say the name of, but is very similar. Buffett did exactly the same thing, which is he was talking on a call this person, and he said, um, you know, well, we did whatever, which is a dumb thing that we did. He said, and when I say we did, I did it. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but I thought it was gonna, this was gonna happen, and it turned out that you know our competitors did this, and so it was dumb that we um, made that decision and to go into that market, and we're not doing it again. Um, and Buffett will say that sort of thing, you know, that... It, yeah, the honesty. Right. Um, but that's hard to do if you're a group of people, and it's hard to do if you made those uh, decisions in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's easier with, like, founder-like companies and things a lot of times. Um, companies that aren't founder-led and, ha- and have other sorts of stakeholders and stuff, it does get a little more um, political. They have to be more careful about their communications. What do you think about companies that their sole strategy is like acquisitions kind of like valiant i mean would you well, just always do sole i mean berkshire too but yeah. i mean yeah it doesn't matter I, mean, I get it i understand but like like valiant for example was to buy 
uh, drugs and then mm-hmm. hike up the prices. And that's kind of a hot topic, companies that do that. But what do you, like, do you just steer clear of companies that their sole, their sole strategy is acquiring other businesses and doing um, stuff like that? Like kind of like the, the G or um, the 3G model? I don't think know? I've really invested in companies that do that generally. I mean, I've, I invest in some uh, ad companies or something I would buy, I don't know, they'd spend 20% of their free cash flow or something buying other ad agencies. Um, uh, I don't see it as a problem necessarily though. I uh-huh. mean, I don't generally invest in them, uh, but no, I don't see it as a big risk. You know, roll-ups of companies in an industry can be very effective that way. Mm-hmm. Um, if see, if they were doing it without a big, um, investor relations push and stuff, that's fine. The problem with a lot of these are that they're combined with a push to investors about the case for why this is a good business and everything, why what they're doing makes a lot of sense and all those sorts of things. You know, uh, the same approach with something, I mean, we own a stock that has done tons of acquisitions. Sure. Um, uh, we own a stock for instance, that, uh, a family owned stock that is over time bought many of its largest competitors in the industry that it's in, which is um, shades and curtains. And, um, but it's family led company that way. It doesn't really do a big pitch to investors about how it's bought up a lot of market share by taking out these competitors or whatever. Uh, It's when it's combined with the investor relations thing to kind of get the stock price up and and things like that. That's more of a concern. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you know, someone was talking to me recently about a stock in the UK that's pretty small, and that's done a lot of smart acquisitions of small companies. Um, there's a natural arbitrage in markets where you can buy private uh, companies, especially when there's some reason like they can't pass on to the next generation or whatever, at prices that are much, much lower than when combined in a basket they sell for in the stock market. The stock market often values a combination of these things at way higher than um, they would value the than the individual businesses could be sold for or something. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but I often I mean there's a write up of a parking lot operator uh, on the Focus Compounding Gazette, yeah. and that's fine. Um, there, that's a very financial driven uh, thing. But you know, if someone came to me with the idea we're going to buy up a bunch of parking lots or something, I wouldn't be opposed to that idea as like a private business. Yeah. As a public business, it gets a little more complicated because they have this whole push about explaining why they should have really high cap rates and everything. But there's nothing wrong with you know snowballing a bunch of uh, parking lots or something or mm-hmm. a bunch of any other thing that gives off cash flow that way. So, yeah, the Berkshire approach makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, it's usually that it's combined with some sort of investor relations thing. Um, it also has to be combined with not bringing in new uh, c- capital. So you really can't be issuing shares and doing this. But it also, but Berkshire also invests in cap cities, which that was their whole thing was acquisitions all the time. Mm-hmm. It makes a lot of sense in some industries that way, like media or something. You either have to buy back stock, yeah, sure, pay dividends, or acquire other businesses because the free cash flow that you're getting is too high that way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't have a problem with uh, a lot of acquisitions. Who's your favorite manager outside of maybe like Berkshire Hathaway, like Warren Buffett, and who's a good one for people to study? Um, I think we talked about this with like big, um, I mean, the outsiders is a great book to read. Yeah. I read the outsiders. Yeah. Yeah. But does anyone stick out to you? Uh, no. I mean, of the companies that we own, the favorite management is NACA. Mm -hmm. Why? Which doesn't mean the stock would be the They're in the worst industry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But is it because of their history of capital allocation and how they acquired? It's how they talk to shareholders. Got it. Got it. Yeah. They run the business. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Well, that is a great place to stop on our conversation about management. If you want to get more access to Jeff's write-ups, go to www.focuscompoundinggazette.com. Mm-hmm. This is where uh, gannoninvesting.com used to be. Yes. I it's, guess if you go to Gannon Investing, it'll redirect you. I think that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. true. So it's no longer there. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are upset. So good job. <laughs> okay, good <great>. job. <laughs> if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and thumbs up. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next podcast. Hey, this is Jeff Gannon, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Andrew and I talk general investing concepts. To learn about specific stocks I like, go to focuscompoundinggazette.com. That's focuscompoundinggazette.com, and enter your email. Once you enter your email, you'll start getting one free 2,000 word stock right up a week. Andrew and I also manage accounts for clients. To learn more about our managed accounts, email Andrew at info at focuscompounding.com or text or call Andrew at 469-207-5844. Thanks for listening.